What I would like to do starting today is talk about statistical learning and uh, predictive modeling. What we've done so far is what we could call unsupervised learning. This statistical learning, um, well, I guess statistical learning includes both unsupervised and supervised learning. PCA and clustering is unsupervised learning in the sense that we're just exploring a data set. We don't have, in particular, we don't have a response variable or a, a class variable that we are particularly interested in modeling. Supervised learning is where we have uh, some either numeric or categorical response variable or vector of variables that we want to make predictions about using predictor variables. So we're going to start talking about the, the supervised uh, learning. And I'm going to reference this book that I've mentioned before, Introduction to Statistical Learning. If you um, Google that, The top Google hit is the homepage for Gareth James, who is a faculty member at Berkeley and one of the authors of the book. Um, so at their page, you can download a, a copy of the PDF book, which is what I'm referencing in the slides that we're about to start with. Um, in addition to that, just FYI, uh, this Statistical learning stuff is very popular. It's in high demand by employers and such for uh, data science applications um, and similar. So if you want to learn more, they have a, a short course that's available, or at least they did. Um, yeah. So the authors, Trevor Hasty and Rob Tibshirani, um, gave a online course over these materials. So basically, you can go through a course with them lecturing through the slides that we're about to talk through. Um, and videos and stuff are available online. So there's lots of good things that they make available uh, for free, which is cool. Um, OK, so in this book, uh, I have downloaded or put on eCampus the separate chapters that we're going to look at. I wish I had numbered them like chapter one, chapter two, and so on, but I just put the title. Chapter, the first chapter we're going to look at is called Statistical Learning. So this is an uh, overview of the predominantly the, the supervised learning exercise, predictive modeling. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about predictive modeling. Um, We'll talk today about the big picture and some of the core concepts that we'll, uh, we'll have to deal with. Then we'll talk some about predictive modeling when the response variable is numeric. And then we'll talk some separately about if the response variable is categorical. In the numeric case, you're trying to predict a number, like the price of a stock or the score in a football game. In a categorical case, you're trying to predict a category, like this is a spam email or it's not. I'm going to post a, another homework assignment this weekend, and it will include um, exercises in building some simple predictive models. Download a data set, and using what we've learned so far, um, build a model for predicting such and such. and assess its accuracy. If, if our goal, by the way, in this statistical learning is largely to predict, I want to predict the stock price or uh, predict whether you have cancer or not, uh, then the, the primary accuracy or performance measure that we care about will be like an accuracy or an error rate type of measure. Um, if I predict cancer versus normal, how often am I correct in that uh, prediction? So we'll spend a fair amount of time with this material, figuring or, or looking at ways to uh, 
um, assess the accuracy in terms of error rates. You have to be careful, and there's a there's a bag of tricks specifically for estimating how accurate a predictive model is. So this is the, the first chapter, or these are actually the slides that go with the first chapter. Um, if you get the e-book, it'll have an actual uh, chapter of a textbook for you to read through um, more, more holistically. But let's think about the, the problem in its biggest picture. We are trying to model some uh, response variable against one or more predictor variables. We're modeling. I want to build a, uh, a model-based representation of a particular variable, my response variable, whatever it is, in terms of one or more explanatory variables. This slide has some scatter plots on it. And these are from a data set that you can get through the book um, with uh, advertising revenue or advertising sales by um, I think how maybe how much you spent on each of TV radio and newspaper so the left scatter plot is TV on the horizontal axis and sales on the vertical axis so we have a data set where sales is basically the response variable that's what I want to model because I am an employee of this company and we're trying to decide uh, if I pay this much for TV advertising and that much for radio and this much for newspaper, what can I expect our sales to be? We're trying to model that so that we can make predictions and, and decisions. So the statistical learning problem down at the bottom can be expressed really generally as I want to model sales, my response, in terms of some function of my predictor variables, my explanatory variables. Sales is some arbitrary function of the different variables that I think are relevant. One obvious possibility for this function would be a linear function, like a linear regression model. Sales is linearly related to these different predictor variables. But statistical learning generally is interested in that problem and without specifying what, what F is. So there's lots of different ways to go about figuring out a good F. Linear regression is one. Other types of regression, um, random forests, support vector machines, all of these are ways of saying my response is related by a function to some explanatory variables. So in our uh, notation here, sales is the response. And our goal is to predict it. Uh, let me just say something briefly about prediction as, a, as an exercise. If um, you're familiar, I hope, with linear regression, like get my whiteboard, where you have, a let's say, a numeric response. And maybe we have one numeric predictor variable, x, like um, y is uh, annual salary, and x is average number or average cost of the, of the college you went to or something. I want to model y in terms of x. That's just a regression model, and there's lots of things we can do with it. We could, given a data set, if I had n observations of x and y, I could make a picture of them, just a scatter plot. And then if I use that kind of model as the, as the lens I'm going to see the data through, then fitting that model would mean finding the best fitting line to my scatter plot. So I would have this beta 0 that I estimated and a slope that I estimated. That's my fitted uh, linear regression line. We can do things like 
testing whether the beta coefficients equal a particular value. We can get confidence intervals for the betas or linear combinations of the betas. There is a lot that we do with regression that is not prediction, is what I'm trying to say, I guess. I'm talking about prediction, and we're going to be for a while, but linear regression is not necessarily just about prediction. If Y is pain and X is dosage of drug, then our primary scientific interest might be to quantify the effect of the dosage on pain. So like, get a confidence interval for beta one. Not predict pain for a given uh, dosage. Either way, whether you're doing what you might call explanatory modeling, so uh, let me say types of inference. There is a sense in which some of the times we're doing explanatory modeling and some of the times we're doing predictive modeling. By explanatory, I mean like that example I just uh, talked through. What's the effect of dosage? Is there a treatment effect? Is there a difference in lung cancer incidence between smokers and non-smokers? We're trying to explain the relationship. Predictive modeling is less about explaining the relationships that exist and more about just predicting. Statistical learning and this supervised learning stuff, that whole introduction to statistical learning book, is 99% about predictive modeling. And it just turns out that that's a very uh, in-demand skill set right now. Lots of companies have lots of, and, and research organizations have lots of data and predicting is valuable. All right, so we're gonna say, in this case, we have a, a response variable that is sales, and we'll let Y be the response. So far in the class, I've been saying, suppose we have a data set, we'll call the data set X, and it's representable by an N by P array. Now, in supervised learning, we're going to incorporate Y, some response variable. And again, it could be numeric or it could be categorical. There's a separate bag of tricks for predicting with numeric response and categorical. So statistical learning is all about saying Y is some function of X or approximately at least. There's the famous saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. All right. <clears throat> so in this example, we have a univariate response that's numeric, and we have three predictor variables. Um, TV, radio, and newspaper. These are like the, the amount that they spend in advertising on each of those venues. We could just call them generally X1, X2, and X3. So here's like our observed vector, X, for a single individual, three variables. Given a data set, I would have an N by three matrix, capital X. Each row is one uh, ad campaign, I guess. And each column is one of our variables. <clears throat> this slide is uh, similar to what I was talking about in differentiating between explanatory and predictive modeling. What is it good for to do this estimating F? Number one, you can do prediction which is valuable in its own right and sometimes is the, the outright goal of, of whatever we were doing. The second bullet point is more about explanatory things. You can explain and understand the nature of relationships. Okay, so if the goal is to model response in terms of predictor variables in terms of some F, then how do we go about picking F? 
is there an ideal F? There are some um, kind of reasonable and rational guidelines that we can use for defining a good choice of F. For example, we might restrict that whatever F is, if you evaluate it at a particular predictor variable, it comes back as the expected value of the response at that value. So look at this picture up at the top. Imagine that's a data set of a bunch of uh, individuals for each of which we have one response and one predictor variable. We do the scatter plot and we see a suggestion of a relationship between the two. Suppose based on that scatter plot you want to make a prediction for x is equal to 4. What should you predict as x equal to 4? A sensible thing to do would be to take the average of what y tends to be at x equal to 4. That's all this is saying. So a target, a, an ideal for finding f would be to define it uh, as giving back the expected value of the response at every single value. Let me move on. Let me just say something briefly about this slide. In, in the context, we're going to motivate statistical learning in the numeric response context. So y is numeric, then we're talking about a scatter plot as one example, of the simplest example. We have response y versus some predictor variable x. One possible representation of this would be a linear regression model. That's the way we write the linear regression model. We say that the ith response the response for individual i is equal to a deterministic piece, beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. That's a fixed line plus some random deviation from the line. So this is kind of a core idea of modeling. What we're doing with fitting a model is saying, I believe that behind the scatter plot is a systematic deterministic relationship that holds on average. And our goal is to estimate that average behind the scenes population level relationship. In this regression uh, expression, um, the beta 0 plus beta 1 xi is the line behind the scatter plot. So then trying, and trying to get back to estimating f. If I say f is a linear function, how do I pick the estimates, beta 0 and beta 1? Because we, we don't know what they are. They are population parameters. We have a scatter plot. We want to estimate them. So basically, we want to find the, the line that best fits the data in some sense. So back at the slides, this is just walking through how we approach this in the linear regression context. What we do is we find the function f. In the linear regression case, that means we find beta 0 and beta 1. But we find that such that our choice of that minimizes some variation or error, variation from the truth. In the linear regression case, we go looking for beta 0 and beta 1 that make the average squared deviation between the response and the fitted response as small as possible. We minimize the squared error. Uh, 
Um, okay, I'm spending more time on this this part than I intended to. So let's let's keep going, and uh, I think we'll get to some more intuitive material here shortly. We're trying to think about if I want to model y in terms of x using a function f, how do I pick f? Uh, <coughs> let me skip this. Here is a very simple choice of f, the linear model. If I have input or predictor variables x1, x2, dot, 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 xp, one way to define f of vector x is just the linear combination of the x's. That's linear uh, regression. Suppose we, we said that for a data set and we want to estimate the model. Well, we want to fit the model. That means we want to um, pick f. In the linear model context, that means we need to pick beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat and all the others. We need estimates for all of them. The way you, we do it in linear regression is find the betas that minimize the square deviation from the data points and the line. The line holds on average in the population. Our observed data points, the, the black dots, will be bobbing around that. Pick beta 0 and beta 1 such that the average square difference from the line is smallest. And that becomes, in the linear regression case, a calculus problem. Just need to do derivatives and set equal to zero and so on. So that's where ordinary least squares regression comes from. Suppose that, again, we want to do this prediction problem and we want to consider a linear model. I have uh, y is sales from advertising. X1 is the amount we spent on, new, on uh, TV, news, and radio, three variables. I'm going to say, on average, sales equals some intercept plus beta 1 times TV expense, expense plus beta 2 times uh, newspaper, and so on. In order for us to actually estimate that model and then make predictions, we need data. You need to have data that you can uh, use to estimate the model. The data that we require specifically, if the goal is prediction, is called training data. And it looks like this. It is both the response and the predictor variables for a sample of individuals. So we're going to refer to these as training data. Training data in the sense that if you're trying to make predictions, the way you want to build your approach is to take cases that have already been assessed correctly. Here's the predictors and here's the truth for a bunch of individuals. I'll use that to inform my predictions. So if the goal is to predict sales or whether an email is spam or whatever, step one is to go get training data. Many businesses have huge data sets full of customer information and so on. They have lots of training data. You can use that to build a predictive model. But I want us to get comfortable with this idea of training training data, because when it comes to uh, stating how accurate our models are, how accurate our predictive models are, uh, there we'll have to make a distinction between training data and something else. So the slide here says we estimate the parameters by fitting the model to training data. All we mean by fitting it is pick the, the parameters of the model that best match your data. And that depends on what method you're using. If it's linear regression, it's minimizing the squared error. Something to, for uh, certain, keep in mind is that 
your model, no matter how complicated or complex, is almost certainly not correct. We don't believe that uh, perfectly deterministic relationships hold in practice uh, in most cases. So your linear model, while it might be a good approximation and give you some insight into how the data operate, um, always keep in mind it's just a model and it's not perfect. There's always error and uncertainty in a statistical modeling exercise. Here's two examples of possible training data. Both of these, we have a numeric response and one numeric predictor variable. So somebody gives you an Excel spreadsheet. It has two columns in it. One of them is Y, one of them is X. We'd like to predict Y using X. You make a scatter plot, and it looks like this. The dots are what you see. The goal is prediction. So the natural question is, how are we going to choose F? What are we going to use for um, representing the relationship on average? And in this case, we might ask, how about a linear model? Um, in the next case, a linear model may not be appropriate because the, the data in the second scatter plot, if that was the data we observed, does not look like it would be well approximated by a, a line. So maybe we need a more flexible curve in the second case. With a given training data set, you, part of what you need to do is think through what do the data suggest about the nature of relationships in it. Is a linear model plausible? If so, then it's a good choice. But you don't want to apply a linear model where there's lots of curviness, for example. On the other hand, you don't want to apply a quadratic model if it's not needed, because you're just adding more parameters that have to be estimated. They have some nice pictures in the book that illustrate uh, that we're not, of course, limited to the case where there's just one predictor variable. So imagine that we have a response that's income that's Y, and we have two predictor variables, years of education and seniority. Let's model Y in terms of a function F of those two variables. We can extend the same kind of uh, approach from the two-dimensional case to this case, though. Whereas if I just have one predictor variable, I can make a scatter plot and, and fit lines or curves. With two predictor variables, I could try to fit surfaces. So this uh, gradient curve representation is a fitted curve to the scatter plot of red points. R, for example, has uh, tools built in that make it pretty straightforward to fit a curvy surface to a scatter plot like this, a 3D scatter plot. So as a, as a thought exercise, um, <clears throat> imagine that the blue surface is the population level surface. In statistics, we have a population in mind. All uh, middle-aged men, uh, Caucasian, and with this education range, a particular population in mind. And we only approximately, approximately get to talk about it in terms of a sample. But it's the population we're trying to make statements about. On average, if you increase dosage, this happens in the population. So in this uh, slide, blue, we're going to treat it as the population level relationship between the predictors and the response. On average, if you were to set years of education equal to a particular number, and set seniority to another particular number, that corresponds to one dot above which the surface hits somewhere. At that spot, that's the average that you would get if you repeatedly sampled for under this, uh, from this distribution. 
The blue surface is the average response, population average. We wish we knew what it was. But all we're going to have are the red dots. So in terms of building a predictive model, step one is we need training data. And the red dots are our training data. Then we can consider different ways of defining F, ranging from very simple to more complex. This picture here is a simple representation that is uh, the one-dimensional bigger extension of a linear model. So it's a plane, no curviness to it. But just like we could say in a regression context, y equals intercept plus beta 1 times x, and we're specifying a line, there is a way to parameterize this uh, three-dimensional surface. Given the training data, the red dots, we would then ask, there's lots of ways for us to define f. There's lots of different uh, predictive models we could use. We would like to pick the one that does best in some sense. Should we use the, the linear model, or should we use a curvy model? And if it's a curvy model, how curvy should it be? This slide is curvy, but it was restricted to not be too curvy. The next slide is uh, allowed to be more data dependent, more wiggly, so it curves even more. One obvious possibility then as a predictive modeling exercise would be to choose your estimated relationship, to choose f hat, that perfectly interpolates the red dots. So these red dots are our training data. That's what we are going to use to build a predictive model. Our goal is to capture the blue on average, because we want to take the predictions and apply them to the population uh, generally. We're not just interested in our red dots, because that's a sample from the population we want to uh, address. So in the slides, we have three possible models. There's this um, planar model, a linear model. There's this curvy model. And there's a slightly more curvy model. The question we're going to ask is, um, which of those is best? The, the linear one, if you look at the picture, you can see deviations from the red dots and your estimate. You can see places where it didn't predict perfectly. So this is obviously not a perfect representation of the training data. Here, there are also some deviations, if, if you look closer, between the red and the surface. Here, I believe they were able to interpolate perfectly. There's no error. There's no difference between red and the surface. The uh, tricky part is that uh, going for, uh, or getting closer and closer to interpolating the training data is actually counterproductive. The issue is, if we take this really curvy surface, in this case, and perfectly interpolate the red dots, what we're going to do in putting this to practice is go apply it in the real world. So in the real world, here comes some more red dots that weren't in our data set. They're just red dots that were sampled from this. They came from the population. And we're going to start making predictions based on this. The issue is this picture is highly tuned to the sample that we've started with, the training data that we used. And these red dots are random draws from the population. So they're not the population. We don't want to overly emphasize the training data. So there's a big idea in supervised learning of overfitting. And it's a danger that we'll have to uh, learn some special topics for dealing with. But this is basically an il illustration of, of the issue. It is possible to use a very simple model for predicting, in which case you're almost certainly going to have higher errors in the training data. 
but it may possibly be that it actually is better in predicting on average in the whole population than a more complex model. But we're going to have to consider, uh, should I use this one or that one or that one in terms of expected accuracy for it to have in the population at large? We're going to see lots of different predictive model types. Linear regression is a very simple one, but there are lots of fancy words that maybe you've heard of, like random forest and neural networks and support vector machines. Those are all ways to define F, a predictive uh, machine. So you can broadly separate the different methods based on how complex they are. A linear model, for example, is a very simple model. You can interpret its coefficients pretty easily. It's just a linear combination. Other methods like uh, neural networks are highly complex. And it's very difficult, as far as I know, to really interpret what they're doing. So between really simple and really complex is one uh, of the big distinctions for choosing how to model something. Uh, one thing to keep in mind on that point is simpler models are generally more interpretable, like the linear model. The beta coefficient, you can interpret it. It's an average change in the response for a one unit increase in x. If interpretation is relevant and important, then you'll favor a simpler model. If the goal is to build a prediction algorithm for sales based on marketing, and we also want to characterize what's the effect of changing the font in the advertisement. We want to interpret and explain. Then interpretability would be uh, more valuable, and a regression model would look very attractive. So simpler models are easy to interpret. More complex models are harder to interpret. Then we'll have to think about this idea of uh, quantifying the goodness of fit. How good of a fit does our model give us? And this gets us to the point I was mentioning a second ago of overfitting. It's possible to have a model that does brilliantly on your training data, but that does terribly on the population generally. This is just a uh, hypothetical, basically, picture of the several different methods for predicting, predictive methods, in terms of two dimensions. The flexibility, in, like flexibility we mean how a, a more flexible model would be able to um, accurately represent complex relationships. Um, like not linear relationships, things that are more complicated. Flexibility speaks to that. Interpretability speaks to, um, based on your model, can you tell me what the effect or what the impact of this variable is in the final prediction? If you think about these buzzwords in those two uh, terms, you have a picture like this. So uh, least squares regression is relatively low flexibility, but relatively high interpretability. You can make linear, or, yeah, linear regression even simpler by doing something like feature selection. Suppose you have uh, your P, the number of predictor variables, is big. And you want to uh, you do feature selection to select a subset of them to use in the model. Lasso is a technique for doing that. Subset selection is a t technique for doing that. So that's even less flexible because you're limiting the, com the, the number of predictor variables. And less flexibility tends to go with higher interpretability. On the other end, support vector machines and random forests, which are uh, bagging, boosting, tree-based methods, are very, very flexible. They can be applied to highly complex data sets and structures, but the penalty is that they're very hard to in interpret. 
it's hard to say what they're really doing. <clears throat> so how would we score a model in terms of its accuracy? We're going to start by considering, again, the numeric case, where y is a numeric variable. We're going to go looking for f, a function of x. So let me come back. And we have y, we have x, and we're looking for some representation f of x that represents well training data. For a given model that we fit, call it f with a hat on top. If f were linear models, then f with a hat on top would just be beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times x, and so on. This is the fitted or estimated model. For that model, we can assess its accuracy with uh, various things. For example, an average squared difference or an average squared error. This MSE subscript TR is a mean squared error on the training data is what is intended there. The mean squared error of your fitted model on the training data is just the average in the training data of square deviations between truth and predicted according to the fitted model. So you have for all your training data you have X and you have Y Um, if I had F with a hat on top, an estimated F, then I could predict Y, Y hat is F hat at X. If I wanted to predict what the value of X or what the value of Y is at a particular X, call it X zero, my prediction, I could write it as Y hat equals the estimated function evaluated at x0. Then the error at that point is truth minus predicted. For each, for any individual with a predictor variable, we can make a prediction using our fitted function. That corresponds to an error. The error is the difference between the truth for that individual and the predicted value. So this average of a square difference thing, that's what it's doing. Go get truth and get predicted value for every individual in the training data. Take a uh, square that so that all the differences are positive and you can't like cancel out differences and average that up. That's a sensible way to assess the accuracy of a predictive model, the average squared error. It also has some nice mathematical properties, though. So um, we need to distinguish between this error uh, calculation on the training data and what we'll call MSE for testing data, or MSETE. The training data, again, are the data that you built your model with. They are the data that, that had the true answer provided with them. You use them to fit a model, linear regression model or something. So now you have beta hats, and you can make predictions for an arbitrary set of inputs. There is an accuracy of your fitted model in the training data. But there's also an accuracy of your fitted model in individuals that were not used to build the model. So suppose that we had, um, suppose we had n by p and n by 1 as training data. And what we're going to do is split the training data into um, let's call it 
x train y train, which is a subset of the whole n individuals. Maybe we take two-thirds of the individuals and call them training data. That would leave everybody else, n minus n zero by p, that we'll call testing data. They are not going to be used in fitting the model. We would use these data to fit F to get F hat. And the error measure that applies to the training data is called MSE train. But if we were to take F that we estimate and apply it to the test data, these were not used in fitting the model, we would get a different mean squared error because it's different individuals. And in order to guard against overfitting the training data, the testing error rate is more indicative of a generalizable uh, performance. So in terms of picking F, should I pick a really simple one or a really complex one? What we do in practice is try several, and then we score each of them in terms of their accuracy. But the accuracy you want to pay attention to is the generalizable accuracy, the accuracy on samples that were not used to build your model. If you just tune to your training data, you will overfit your data. So this slide, we're going to say more about this, but this slide introduces us to this distinction. There's an accuracy in the training data, and there's a potentially different accuracy in the testing data. And we'll talk about this slide next time, but if you look just briefly at the right picture, this is a plot of, on the x-axis, complexity of a model, going from very simple to very complex. So maybe like a line to something really curvy. And on the vertical axis is mean squared error. It's that error rate. The gray is training error. With this training set, the more complex you make your model, the more accurate you get, to the point that eventually you'll just interpolate the training data. But the red curve is the accuracy that results if you take the fitted model from the training data and apply it to some held out test data. And it has this saddle appearance where there's a trade-off. Adding more complexity helps up to a point beyond which you're adding hurtful things. You're adding more noise maybe to the model and it actually decreases the accuracy. All this supervised learning stuff is going to be about trying to find F. Y is sometimes numeric, sometimes categorical. We've just talked in the context of Y being numeric, and a big concern will be estimating the accuracy of our models. With numeric Y, we use a mean squared error often. If Y is categorical, like cancer versus not cancer, we might use a misclassification rate. Uh, we'll also meet the ideas of sensitivity and specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value all those types of error measures that are for categorical response. OK, uh, we'll let you go. I've got yeah, uh, homework is coming. And uh, I've got time budgeted this weekend to tidy up what remains of grades. So watch for homework. And um, in the ISL book, we'll go through some R examples in class. And I'll have you do it in your homeworks. But um, if you want to read ahead a little bit, the ISL book has, at the end of each chapter, some example R code that you can use to play along. And I, my impression of them is they're pretty helpful and pretty straightforward. So, All right, have a good weekend. Thank you.